Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, whatever the case may be. I want to welcome you to the ISJIP Live Journal Club. Um, our theme today is going to be the uterine cervix. And uh, my name is Ian Hitgeman. I'm speaking from Washington University in St. Louis. And my co-moderator, Becca Walski from the University of Colorado is also on the line. Uh, we have Natalie Benet, our um, originator and mentor of the Journal Club. And we have our three presenters who I'll present to you briefly. Before we get to today's programming, uh, I'll just draw your attention to a couple of upcoming ISJIP live events. Uh, next week, we will drop a podcast about uh, ICCR guidelines for reporting cervical cancer by Dr. McCluggage. That has been put together by Drs. Watkins and Chapel uh, and will be an interesting listen for you. Uh, we also have our interesting case presentations by residents, uh, fellows, and early career pathologists moderated by Jenny Bennett from Chicago, and that will also be uh, next week, January 25th at noon U.S. Eastern Time. Please tune in. Our journal club happens every month. Uh, we take a couple of breaks for USCAP and uh, winter holidays, but it does alternate between the two hemispheres. We're global, uh, so we alternate between the, the third Wednesday uh, of Western Hemisphere months, uh, thir third Wednesday of the month at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time in the United States. And then the Eastern Hemisphere uh, Club is the third Thursday of every other month at 12 noon Melbourne time. It's a little confusing until you show a calendar that clears it up. We alternate between the Western and Eastern Hemispheres, and we've already chosen the topics for the rest of 2023. So we'll have uh, the Eastern Hemisphere in February, and then a break for USCAP, and then we'll come back. This is actually my first session to be moderating, uh, so thank you for your uh, patience with any possible hiccups. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity, and uh, I look forward to sharing these articles uh, with all of you. Uh, we do have several venues in which trainees and early career pathologists can make their voice heard, uh, the two journal clubs and the interesting case presentations. If you're interested in presenting or if you have trainees who would like to present at some of these venues, just send us a note and let us know. We'll be happy to get your trainee on the schedule with the caveat that we do plan out a certain distance. So uh, there are limited dates available, but we would love to feature you or your trainees. And we offer uh, mentorship ahead of the event and assistance in planning the session to make it a good experience. Today, we do have three uh, trainees. We have Dr. Swati Bardwaj from Mount Sinai, uh, Dr. Madalena Sutomura from the Portuguese Oncology Institute in Portugal, and Dr. Ivan Aglablin, who is a resident of the Cleveland Clinic. They'll present in this order. I don't want to take too much of their time here. Uh, so I'll just briefly show the overview of their articles. Uh, we'll go in this order. Uh, and uh, actually, the third article is not purely about the cervix, but some of the interesting findings are in the cervix. We're making a recording. If you should want to go back and uh, listen to this again, uh, the references for these articles were also included in the invitation email that you may have received. Uh, so we want to make it easy for you to find the articles. Uh, we do have some predetermined learning objectives for the Journal Club. We want to engage our audience, but also our presenting trainees in evaluating the literature, learning how to obtain uh, scientific knowledge from the medical literature. Uh, we want to provide mentorship and engage future leaders uh, in our field. We encourage the presenters to use a predetermined format that won't be too surprising to anyone who's either written, read articles, or been to a journal club before, uh, focusing on uh, the paper as it's written, the methods, results, and interpretation, uh, as well as uh, examining the paper for strengths and areas for improvement, and then finally wrapping up by talking about how this could apply to clinical practice. So I'm almost done with my introduction here. We'll have Dr. Bardwaj come in uh, in just a moment. This is a webinar format. I see already there are a couple of things in the chat. There is a Q&A function. You can socially vote on questions. If we do have time for questions at the end, we'll take them. Uh, we won't do a question period after each talk, just to make sure that we do get to everything. And the chat is primarily for fun. You can let us know where you're calling from and 
uh, send greetings to your friends and the like. So I'll stop sharing my screen and Dr. Vardwaj, you are invited to share your screen. For the rest of the panelists, you can mute yourselves and turn off your video so that we can focus on the presentations. And I wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be presenting the article titled Genomic Characterization of Small Cell Carcinomas of the Uterine Cervix. This was published in the journal Molecular Oncology last year in 2022. Um, so uterine cervical swim, uh, small cell carcinomas are caused by HPV, and thus they bear resemblance to other HPV-related carcinomas in the fact that they're sharing the same common etiology. And on the basis of morphology, uh, their aggressive behavior, prognosis, and treatment strategies, they bear resemblance to small cell carcinomas of the lung and other sites. The molecular signature of lung small cell carcinomas is very well established, and almost all of them bear TP53 and retinoblastoma 1 inactivating mutations. However, the molecular signature of uterine cervix small cell carcinomas is not known. So it's not known whether it's going to be similar to other HPV-related carcinomas of the cervix and head and neck or to other small cell carcinomas arising in the lung or other GI sites. So this is the question that the study aims to answer. That is to define the constellation of somatic mutations, copy number alterations, and mutational signatures of uterine cervical small cell carcinomas, and then to compare this mutational profile with other HPV-positive head and neck and cervical uh, carcinomas and small cell carcinomas of the lung and those arising from other sites. Uh, the cases for the study were selected from four different institutes over a 20-year period by querying the database with the terms neuroendocrine and small cell carcinoma. Those small cell carcinomas which were known to arise from the lung or those in which there wasn't sufficient information to exclude metastatic deposits to the cervix were excluded from the study. Then h &E and IHC slides were reviewed by four pathologists and blocks with the greatest tumor percentage were selected for molecular or other downstream analysis. For the purposes of the study, small cell carcinomas were defined on the basis of morphology as cohesive tumors uh, showing round to oval tumor cells with sparse cytoplasm, finely granulated nuclei showing nuclear molding with inconspicuous nucleoli, and in addition, showing immunohistochemical evidence of neuroendocrine differentiation by the presence of at least one IHC neuroendocrine marker, synaptophysin or chromogranin, and a proliferation index on KI67 staining of greater than or equal to 50%. By using these criteria, a total of nine small cell carcinomas of the uterine cervix were identified. Immunohistochemistry was performed with a cytokeratin, KI67, chromogranin and or synaptophysin and P16, if not done earlier. Nucleic acid was extracted from eight micron sections from uh, mostly formalin fixed paraffin embedded sections, but for two cases, in addition, frozen tissue was also available, thus they were subjected to RNA sequencing as well. And micro dissection was performed to ensure that the tumor cell percentage was at least 80%. HPV typing was done using standard PCR, using known specific prim uh, primers. Six cases were subjected to whole exome sequencing while uh, for three cases, MSK impact uh, sequencing was performed for 505 genes. As I mentioned earlier, since uh, frozen tissue was available for two cases, these two cases were the ones on which RNA sequencing was also performed. And if after getting the molecular profile from all of these methods, it was compared with the known database having the molecular profile for HPV positive head and neck and cervical cancers and small cell carcinomas of the lung, the NIH Genomic Data Commons was used as the source for these data. So um, coming to the results, uh, all of these nine cases were pure small cell carcinomas. So there was no evidence of squamous or adenocarcinoma differentiation, and there were no pre-neoplastic lesions as well. None of the cases had a prior history of any other malignancy. And the patient age ranged from 27 to 55 years with a median age of 40 years. All of the cases were P16 positive, suggesting HPV etiology, which was also confirmed on HPV PCR typing. With the exception of one case that was positive for HPV 16, all other cases were, uh, showed HPV 18 as the etiologic agent. 
This is just a representative case showing the typical morphology of small cell carcinoma. So we see cohesive tumor growth. Uh, the tumor cells are oval, uh, round to oval in shape. They have very scant cytoplasm. The nuclei show granular chromatin. There are inconspicuous nucleoli, and we can appreciate the nuclear molding here as well. And as mentioned earlier, there was a uh, cytokeratin positivity was dot-like, and in addition, there was chromogranin and or synaptophysin positivity. KI67 index was greater than equal to 50%. Uh, now, what was the repertoire of uh, somatic alterations in these tumors? Uh, it was no identified that the genetic alterations in small cell carcinomas were heterogeneous. Few mut mutations were seen in previously described cancer-related genes, such as PIK3CA, TP53, NF1, IDH1, NOTCH2, and FGFR3. And uh, no retinoblastoma-1 mutations were found. This is of significance because they are present in small cell carcinomas of the lung, especially, and of other sites. Majority of the mutations were passenger mutations. Only few hotspot mutations were identified. Uh, of note, there were two cases that showed TP53 mutations case number two and nine, and then there were others with PIK2CA and GNAS mutations. Uh, case number eight did not show any uh, somatic mutation in any of the 505 cancer-related genes tested. Uh, this is a figure showing, uh, diagrammatically showing similar findings. As you can see, these uh, are individual bar graphs representing each case, and SCC8 is absent from this figure because I mentioned it did not show any mutations. These uh, bars in red are representative of hotspot mutations. And as we can see, there are barely any. So there are just two cases showing, three cases showing these red bars. So there were few hotspot mutations. Most were just uh, passenger mutations. Similar to other virus-related cancers, uh, small cell carcinomas of the cervix showed few copy number alterations. These are uh, graphs from uh, each of the cases. And we can see there was only one case showing FOXO3 deletion, and amplification of MIC gene was seen in one case. RNA sequencing was performed on two cases uh, because uh, it, the frozen tissue was available on two cases only, and it did not show any predicted in frame fusion transcripts. However, viral integration sites were identified in these two cases. In one of them, it was on the long arm of chromosome 18 and another one on the short arm of chromosome 8. Now we come to the second part uh, of the study, that is comparison of the mutational profile of small cell carcinomas with those of small cell carcinomas of the lung on the right, and with those of HPV-related carcinomas of head and neck and cervix. Overall, uh, we see very few colors in this uh, left-sided figure showing the small cell carcinomas of the cervix. That means there were very few mutations identified. So overall mutation rate was very low at 0.72 mutations per megabasis. This number is very high on the other extreme, that is small cell carcinomas of the lung, where overall mutation rate is 7.37 mutations per megabasis. The figure for other HPV-related carcinomas, including those from the head and neck and uh, cervix, is somewhere in between with 2.28 mutations for head and neck HPV-related cancers and 3.7 mutations per MB for cervical HPV-related car cancers. Another important thing to note is that small cell carcinomas of the lung, this is the top part that shows a lot of mutations, and this represents TP53 mutations. So they are present in small cell carcinomas of the lung and distinctly absent in HPV-related cancers as well as HPV-related small cell carcinoma of the cervix. There was one uh, PIK3CA mutation identified uh, that is similar to HPV-related carcinomas from other sites, including head and neck and cervix. Then uh, individual mutational signatures were also compared between all of these cancers. So the first bar over here is the one that represents small cell carcinomas. And the first thing that we notice is there is no purple here. So there was a distinct lack or absence of smoking-related signature in small cell carcinomas of the cervix. They did show a large amount of uh, aging-related signature as well as epobec signature was seen. These two signatures are, are similar to those seen in other HPV-related carcinomas, including those arising in the head and neck and other HPV-related cancers from the cervix itself. And also very different from uh, small cell carcinomas of the lung, which show a predominant uh, smoking signature and a small proportion of aging signature with nearly no to minimal apopex signature. 
So overall, on the basis of these two uh, summary of these findings, uh, small cell carcinomas of the cervix are distinct from small cell carcinomas of the lung, and they bear some resemblance to HPV-related cancers of uh, head and neck, as well as other cervical cancers that are HPV-related in terms of their mutational profile. Thus, this study helps us in resolving uh, two hypotheses that have existed for a long time about the origin of small cell carcinomas. So these tumors, it has been hypothesized that because uh, they are also small cell carcinomas and have an aggressive behavior and biology, so they might be genetically similar to small cell carcinomas of the lung is one of the hypotheses. And the other one states that because they are also arising due to HPV-related etiology, so they might be similar to adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinomas of the cervix, and they eventually acquire additional mutations, and that is how it is hypothesized that they arise from adenor squamous cell carcinoma. Considering that uh, we found that mutation, the authors found that the mutations were similar to HPV-related cancers of other site and very distinct from small cell carcinomas of the lung, the first hypothesis is ruled out. Uh, in comparison to other studies, uh, this study showed similar results. So previous studies have also identified only fewer, uh, few cases with TP53 mutations. As was seen here, there were only two out of nine cases that showed TP53 mutations, and some cases with PIK3CA mutations, as was seen in this study also. This is one of the mutations that is also seen in other HPV-related cancers. The authors also found that uh, small cell carcinomas of the cervix harbor even fewer genetic alterations than HPV-positive head and neck cancers or HPV-positive adeno and squamous cell carcinomas of the cervix. In addition, most cases were found to be etiologically uh, related to HPV-18 in contrast to common cervical type cancers that are HPV-16 positive. Now, this is similar to other HPV-related neuroendocrine carcinomas. Even in the head and neck, HPV-18 is said to be the more common etiologic agent for neuroendocrine causes. HPV-related tumor genesis is driven by E6 and E7, which we know then inactivate TP53 and retinoblastoma. Thus, these cases, even though they did not show any somatic mutation in TP53 and retinoblastoma, yet had a functional inactivation because of the HPV-related E6, E7 driven pathway. The strengths of the study uh, are that it's the first study to look into the comprehensive molecular profile of small cell carcinoma of cervix and also to compare it with other HPV-related cancers and small cell carcinomas of the lung and other sites. In addition, it provides insights and answers to long hypothesized origin of small cell carcinomas of the cervix in comparison to other HPV-related cancers. And the areas of improvement are that the sample size was uh, small, uh, which is explainable by the fact that these tumors are very aggressive and very few of them undergo resection to allow for further studies. Only two cases were sequenced using RNA sequencing. In addition, uh, non-coding alterations and or changes at the epigenetic level cannot be ruled out on the basis of the analysis that was conducted here. Uh, the only application uh, that we can think of is that it can help us in determining primary versus metastatic origin of small cell or neuroendocrine carcinomas occurring in the cervix, although it's a rare scenario. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the presentation. We will move right along with Dr. Sutomura. If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A, and uh, you can also upvote questions that you see there that you also have. I'll go ahead and spotlight you and let you share your screen. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. First of all, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to be presenting here in this journal club. My name is Madalena. I'm a fifth year pathology resident at the Portuguese Institute of Oncology in Porto, Portugal. And the article, sorry. Can you see the screen, right? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. So the article I will present today is a Japanese retrospective study entitled Clinical Effects of Cervical Conization with Positive Margins in Cervical Cancer. So in Japan, um, uh, cervical cancer is still rising. 
in part because uh, prevention programs such as HPV vaccination and cytology are not adequate yet. And according to Japanese guidelines and also NCCN guidelines for cervical cancer treatment, and here I show you a brief flowchart of the Japanese guidelines, colonization besides being recommended as a treatment option, it is, always, it is also recommended if cervical biopsy is inadequate to define invasiveness or if accurate assessment of microinvasive or spread of the disease is required. So in Japan, in, uh, initial colonization is performed in precancerous lesions and also in stage 1A cancers. And then uh, depending on the pathological findings, namely lymphovascular invasion and margin status, further treatment is done which almost always includes at least total hysterectomy with or without pelvic lymph node dissection. So based on these recommendations, what the authors propose to study is the clinical impact of a colonization with positive margins, uh, namely in terms of positive lymph node metastasis, overall survival and progression-free survival. And for that, the, the, the authors gathered together all the patients who underwent radical surgery, including pelvic lymph node dissection for cervical cancer in a Japanese hospital from January 2010 to May 2020, and only radical surgery with lymph node dissection was included. And then the authors excluded all the cases that had no previous colonization, which were a lot of cases, so probably these cases were diagnosed with a biopsy or curatage and they were left with 101 cases. And from this, they divided in two groups, the positive margin group with positive margins at colonization and the negative margin group with negative margins at colonization. And then they gathered together some clinical pathological information and they compared this information between the two groups, especially in terms of outcome, in terms of lymph node metastasis, overall survival and progression-free survival. The statistical methods used are this cited in the, in the slide, and the authors considered a p-value of less than 0 0.05 uh, statistically significant. So, uh, as you see, uh, regarding um, all the variables that were analyzed and collected uh, and compared between the positive margin group and the negative margin group, none of them was statistical, st statistically different. So all the p-values were higher than 0 0.05 uh, regarding age, phagostage, histological type, tumor size, stromal invasion, and LVSI at colonization. And regarding phagostage, the most prevalent, both in positive and negative margin groups, was 1B1. And in the negative margin groups, there were no higher stages than 1B1. And regarding histological type, uh, squamous cell carcinoma was the most prevalent, again, in positive and negative margin groups. And just a, a, a brief word uh, regarding stromal invasion, there was only one case of deep stromal invasion, which was in the positive margin groups. Then the authors tried to understand if positive margins at colonization were related to uh, disease progression. So they evaluated LVSI at radical surgery, also, and they saw that in positive margin group, LVSI at radical surgery was indeed higher than in negative margin group, and this time this was statistically significant. And they also saw that although lymph node metastasis was higher in positive margin group versus negative margin group, this was not st statistically significant. And then the authors did the same exact analysis for the most prevalent cohort. Uh, in this group, which was stage 1B1 squamous cell carcinoma, and the results were exactly the same. Then the authors tried to evaluate the differences between LVSI at colonization and at radical surgery, and what they saw was that in most cases they were concordant. However, there were four cases uh, which did not have LVSI at colonization, but then turned to have LVSI at radical surgery and three of them belong to the positive margin group. And then they give such an example, uh, no LVSI at colonization and LVSI at radical hysterectomy. And more than that, no signs of lymph node metastasis at the time of colonization, but with signs of lymph node metastasis uh, at radical surgery, meaning that there was disease progression. Uh, but on the other hand, they also uh, show us a 
big percentage, 30 to 40 percent of cases that had no LVSI, uh, sorry, that had LVSI at colonization, but then turned to have no LVSI at radical surgery. And finally, uh, the authors evaluated progression-free survival and overall survival, and they compared it between the two groups. And again, there were no statistically significant differences, both for progression-free survival and overall survival between negative and positive uh, margin groups. So um, what we know and what the authors say is that colonization with positive margins is a real risk. And what they ask is if that, even if we know that this risk exists, can we still uh, perform colonization? Um, and they also mentioned briefly the possibility of influence of, sur of surgical techniques on the outcome of cervical cancers. For example, they say that minimally invasive radical hysterectomy is associated with a higher risk of LVSI than conventional ab abdominal radical hysterectomy namely because of a higher pressure that uh, higher intra-abdominal pressure that is created during the surgery. But what the authors conclude is that positive margins at colonization are indeed uh, associated to an, to an increased risk of LVSI at radical surgery, but no statistically significant differences seen in lymph node metastasis overall survival and progression-free survival. So although the rate of LVSI uh, was significantly higher in radical surgery um, in positive margin groups versus negative margin groups, this difference was not reflected in outcomes. So a positive margin at colonization is not a significant prognostic disadvantage. Uh, however, they also say that there were 30 to 40 percent of cases that had LVSI at the beginning and then did not have um, at the resection specimen. Uh, is this because of the main tumor was removed or because grossing of the lesion at radical surgery was not re representative enough? Um, and also, uh, again, they mentioned these cases that progress, that rapidly progress, they exist. So the clinicians should still pay attention to this rapid progressive disease. Uh, and they also mentioned some other studies that corroborate their results. Some studies that uh, show that positive margin at colonization is associated with residual disease, but no further risk of parametrial invasion. And then another study that says that there were no differences in LVSI, lymph node metastasis, recurrence, and death. So um, I think that the main strength of this article is uh, that it supports colonization as an important and accurate diagnosis and or treatment option for early stage cancer cervical cancer, which is important because it's a less um, aggressive surgical method with less complications. And very important, it gives the possibility to many women to preserve uh, the, the fertility, which is very important for many of them. Uh, and uh, regarding the areas of improvement, uh, they don't address, the, the authors don't address the, the statistical power of the study. Are the samples uh, representative? Um, uh, and again, regarding this uh, this topic, they talk about the pro the progression cases, but they are very small in number. So probably more cases such uh, these ones are needed to understand the true behavior. Uh, also, they don't tell us how many cases and how, which cases had residual disease present because this could somehow impact uh, the outcome. And again, we don't know um, if the positive margins are for invasive cancer or for high-grade precancerous lesions can these uh, also influence the outcome. And finally, uh, the FIGO stage classification used uh, in this study is the 2008. Now we have a new one with subtile differences that probably and or possibly can uh, influence the outcome too. So regarding applications, I think that the most important is that uh, colonization is still and can be and can be recommended as a good option for diagnosis and our treatment of early stage cervical cancer, even if we have positive margins. Of course, I think we should all try negative margins, and I think that everyone tries to. 
uh, this is important because it, pos it gives the possibility of a complete or near complete treatment in some cases and preserves fertility again. Um, also, um, although rare, there were these cases of rapid progressive diseases, so clinicians should, should still pay attention to them. And again, try to understand if the new FIGO classification is, uh, a, uh, if, we, if we can apply these results to this new FIGO uh, uh, classification. As for future directions, probably improve the statistical power of the study. Uh, the sets, maybe the samples should be should have more numbers. Um, it would be interesting too if they could stratify survival analysis by FIGO stage. Uh, also include cases of less aggressive surgery like total hysterectomy. I think it was not included in this article because they wanted to evaluate if lymph node metastases were present or not. And uh, in total hysterectomy, from what I understood in Japanese guidelines, uh, almost never uh, is performed a, a lymph node, uh, a pelvic lymph node dissection. And also, uh, probably as they mentioned, the surgical techniques and their uh, risk of LVSI, it would be interesting to detail and stratify the risk according to surgical technique uh, performed. And thank you very much. That's all. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for the presentation. We'll move along to Dr. Aglablin, if you'd like to share your screen. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, well, good afternoon to all the panelists and the participants of the Journal Club. Uh, my name is Ivana Globlin, and I'm a uh, pathology resident in Cleveland Clinic uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. So today I will talk to you about the work of the group from New York. Uh, the name of this work is Histologic Findings in Gynecologic Tissue from Transmasculine Individuals Undergoing Gender Affirming Surgeries. So the aim of this work was to describe and evaluate histopathologic and cervical cytologic findings from transmasculine patients who undergo uh, gender affirming surgery. And the design of the study was chosen as a retrospective review from single institution in New York. Uh, and the authors chose the cohort of the patients who are undergoing um, gender affirming surgery for the period of five years from January 2015 to June 2020. Uh, the authors reviewed the associated health records of this patient with regard to the age, body mass index, uh, presence of comorbidities, as well as hormonal therapy uh, that the patient received. And the, uh, they reviewed all the surgical specimens, uh, gynecological surgical specimens received from this patient by two uh, independent uh, pathologists. So before we start, uh, before I'll show you the findings uh, of the authors, let's look at the demographics of the patients uh, that, that the authors were able to obtain. So most of these patients, there were 55 patients in the cohort. Uh, most of the patients are expectedly young. The, the median age was uh, 27 years. Uh, the main uh, clinical parameters here is that majority of the patients are of normal BMI or what we classified as mildly obese, uh, BMI, uh, mildly obese patients by the BMI, by the body mass index. Uh, with regard to the presence of comorbidities, uh, majority of this patient, not the majority, but significant proportion of this patient had a uh, associated psychiatric diagnosis, mostly depression and anxiety, as well as in 9% of the patients showed other presence of other psychiatric disorders that probably correlates with the, uh, with the diagnosed gender dysphoria syndrome, and therefore they undergo treatment for, for this as a gender reaffirming surgery. The vast majority of these patients received uh, the androgen therapy in the form of testosterone in various preparation and various dosages. Only 4%, uh, meaning two, two patients out of 55 patients in the cohort, did not receive any androgen therapy prior to the surgery. And the uh, majority of these patients received uh, long-term uh, androgen therapy. It's more than two years, and, and about 30 third of the patients received uh, androgen therapy for more than five years. So 
With regard to the main findings, uh, the authors class, uh, classify these findings into groups. They looked at the vagina, they look at the cervix, they look at the endometrium and biometrium, and they look at the adnexa. So I'll start this uh, presentation from the findings uh, that were discovered in the evaluation of endometrium and myometrium. As expected, uh, majority, vast majority of this patient shows the inactive endometrium with some stromal fibrosis. So you can see on this uh, panel A, you can see the inactive tubular glands. Um, they look atrophic with some cystic dilatation and the rarity of the stromal cells. So that would correspond to the, that's, that's an expected finding corresponding to the long-term uh, androgen therapy and therefore the hormone-induced um, endometrial um, atrophy in this patient. Interesting enough, in about 17% of the patients and 7% of the patients, there were evidence of, uh, of the cycling endometrium. Thus, in 7% of the patients, the authors saw that the endometrial glands have a secretory type change. So they are, uh, they show the uh, convoluted glands with the secretory change. However, the author made a conclusion that despite of the presence of cycling endometrium, the thickness of this endometrium were thin in all patients. And 17% of the patients showed proliferative changes, which is not shown here. A uh, small amount of patients also showed the atrophy, not only in the, in, the, in the endometrium, but also in the smooth muscle of the myometrium. So you can see that the smooth muscle bundles are being verified by this intervening uh, fibros fibrotic change. So because of the presence in about 25% of the patients, the presence of the cycling uh, endometrium, the authors made a conclusion against the use of testosterone preparation as, in this patient as a, as a method of contraception. So now let's look at the cervix. The 40%, a little bit over the 40% of the patient uh, evaluating the cervix show that the cervix undergoing what they call transitional cell metaplasia, meaning that the normal uh, and uh, normal epithelial lining of the cervix, which is the squamous or in the ectocervix or the glandular in the endocervix, is being replaced by the urothelial type lining. In this magnification here, uh, it's hard to tell if this, this epithelium is truly transitional uh, metaplasia or atrophic, uh, atrophic epithelium of the cervix. However, the main points for the practicing pathologist here is that the epithelium is relatively thick and it shows the cells which looks very blue and a low power. And it's, this increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio involves the entire thickness of the epithelium. And this type of lining can be easily uh, confused or being a diagnostic pitfall for the high-grade uh, squamous dysplasia of the cervix. To prove that this is not a high-grade picture here, uh, the immunohistochemical stains were performed. Thus, P16 shows absolute uh, negative staining, so this epithelium does not uh, uptake any P16 stain, uh, which is an argument against uh, the presence of high-grade squamous dysplasia. As long as the authors did Ki67 uh, proliferation marker, which shows a very, um, a, a very minimal amount of proliferating cell in the basal, uh, restricted mostly to the basal layer. So therefore, this is not, even though it potentially can mimic the high-grade dysplasia, this is not a high-grade dysplasia, and authors attributed it to the transitional cell metaplastic change of the cervical lining. The curious findings were also were uh, found within the cervix is that in these patients, about 20% of this patient having a fully developed uh, prostatic type glands. Histologically, these glands look like a prostate gland from the cis male patients. They have a bilayer with the myoepithelial or basal layer at the bottom and the abluminal or epithelial layer on top. So here it shows you that most of these glands are quite small and poorly formed, but they're present there. They usually start uh, forming at the base of the epithelial lining and then they extend to the stroma. So here you can see this prostatic type glands in subepithelial distribution, as well as in the right side of the picture, you can see a normal endocervical gland of the cervix. To show that these glands are truly have a prostatic phenotype, the authors perform the immunohistochemical stain with the prostatic markers. Thus, NKX 3.1 shows the nuclear staining of these uh, of the epi of this epithelial cell in these glands, which is corresponding to the prostatic uh, type phenotype. And PEX8 stain only stained the normal endocervical glands and was negative in this prostatic type change, 
which again collaborates that this is a truly prostatic type metaplasia occurring in this patient, and likely this change has been driven by the testosterone therapy this patient received. Uh, the authors also uh, reviewed the available uh, cytological preparations from this patient, mostly the cervical uh, uh, pap smears. In majority of the patients, the pap smear was a, um, uh, just show the atrophic squamous uh, epithelium, and in a very rare events, I think in one patient, they saw some glycogenation of the cells with the uh, yellow uh, lipid type deposits in the cell, which can potentially mimic the low-grade squamous dysplasia. So they only reviewed the available cytological preparation. However, there was no any correlation was made in between uh, histological findings, uh, meaning the transitional type metaplasia or prostatic type glands and the cervical findings in the cytology that they could see. So similar to the cervix, the, uh, the vaginal lining also showed uh, the prostatic type glands formation. So here again, you can see this is uh, a vaginal wall and you can see the fully developed uh, prostatic type glands. And this type of change was present in about 67% of the patients that they reviewed. Again, similar to the cervix, this uh, shows the prostatic phenotype, which was shown by the positive nuclear staining with the prostatic uh, type marker in KX3.1. So you can see that the luminal cells, luminal epithelial cells, all having a nuclear uptake. And the show the bilayered nature of these glands. The P63 stain uh, was performed, which shows the nuclear uptake of the basal layer uh, of these glands. Again, this goes along with the uh, prostatic type phenotype of these glands likely driven by the testosterone therapy of these patients. So the changes in the adnexer, uh, the most of the uh, changes were in 57% of the patients, they showed the cystic follicles. So they just showed that the, the uh, follicles were dilated within the ovarian uh, cortex. Uh, and these changes reminded, uh, is very reminiscent to the change of the ovaries you expect from the patient with the uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. As you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome is the also hyperandrogenic state, and that could be the effect of the testosterone hormone in this patient. That's, that's why this finding looks similar to the patient with the PCOS or polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome. So interesting enough, again, in, in a large proportion, also see not only the cystic change, but they also saw the, the some of the follicles actually showing maturation, and uh, uh, they, they did identify the antral type follicles as well. So on this uh, panel B, you can see three different types of follicles. So you see a normal, small, primordial follicles in the cortex. You see the uh, maturing antral follicle and also the cystic follicles, similar to the one you can see on the left side of the picture. So, and uh, again, this goes along with the changes. This goes along with the fact that the ovulatory event might happen in this patient. And similar to the cyclin nature in the endometrium, these changes in the ovaries goes along with the uh, point that the authors made that testosterone types preparation should not be used as a contraceptive method uh, in this patient. Another curious finding in the NEXA was the uh, hypertrophy of the mesonephric remnant. Here on the picture D, uh, you see the small epithelial remnants, which are embryonic remnants from the mesonephric ducts, and they usually occur along the tubules. So these are the paratubal mesonephric remnants, the, the one you can see in any, uh, in, in, in any specimen. This can happen in, in any type of patient. This is the incidental findings you can see on the histology. Interesting enough, for the, in these patients, uh, some of these remnants become cystically dilated uh, with the with the epithelial lining that reminds the epididymis. So that's why these findings were um, called as a paratubal epididymis like mesonephric remnant hypertrophy. So something would start being reminiscent of the uh, epididymis, epididymal tissue in the uh, cis male patients. The other findings were uh, trivial and they were like listed on the right side with uh, the associated frequency. So the take home message from all these findings is that the many histological histological changes in these specimens from transmasculine patients, they're not commonly encountered in the uh, cisgender women, and they believe to be related to the testosterone exposure. And uh, therefore, under the exposure of testosterone, these changes recapitulate the uh, changes you could see in the cisgender man, uh, male tissue. The frequent transitional cell metaplasia occurring in the uh, 
cervix should be recognized in this patient as it's a close mimicker of the high-grade squamous dysplasia. Uh, findings demonstrate that patients who are exposed to testosterone can still experience ovulatory events. It, shows by the, it was shown by the maturation of the ovarian follicles as well as presence of the cycling change in the endometrium. And therefore, once again, the contraception uh, method using testosterone preparation should not be used in these patients. And changes in the ovary, ovaries in this patient exposed to testosterone resemble changes in other um, uh, hyperandrogenic states, uh, in particular in polycystic ovarian syndrome. So the certain areas of improvement for this work, the authors themselves acknowledge that they have a relatively small sample size, and it's the main limitation of the current work. Uh, so the number of patients uh, was 55 patients in a cohort. However, because this work was not a hypothesis driven and did not rely on any statistical analysis, 55 patients of the transmasculine uh, patients undergoing uh, this type of surgery probably is sufficient for the purpose of description of the uh, common findings you might expect to see in this, in this tissue. Uh, another area of improvement could be that establishing a, a control cohort uh, would help in to determine the hormonal effect on the frequency of the described histological findings to see if similar type of findings can be seen in the um, women that did not have any testosterone exposure, for example. There is not much uh, uh, in the view of basic science regarding the effect of testosterone on this tissue and the mechanisms uh, behind how these gland, uh, how these metaplastic changes do occur and what drives them. Uh, correlating patients' characteristics such as dose or route of and duration of administration of testosterone therapy with the associated histological findings could also help us to understand the effect of testosterone on the various tissues. Uh, certain changes could be attributed to pre-existing medical conditions like uh, presence of the uh, polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome in this patient and therefore should be certain changes should be uh, closely correlated with the uh, medical history and other conditions of these patients. And a uh, larger review of the cytological specimens and their histological correlates would really help us to see if the described tissue effects changes could also be present uh, and be a potential diagnostic pitfalls in the cytological preparations. So this, this work is uh, uh, very applied as far as practicing pathologists goes for the several reasons. Uh, the work uh, summarized very frequent histological findings and changes, uh, and already described some of the potential diagnostic pitfalls. Uh, in certain parts of the world, uh, the number of such surgeries and the number of specimens from uh, transmasculine patients and other patients undergoing uh, gender reaffirming surgery is increasing, and therefore general pathology should be familiar with certain expected findings that you could see in both cytological and histological preparations, uh, resections, or biopsies. And uh, general knowledge of presence of side changes and probably understanding their mechanism could also lead to a better understanding of the gender transition process and the roles of hormones uh, on, the, on the human physiology in general. I think this slide concludes my presentation. So thank you all so much for your attention. And uh, I think we will gladly take any questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, all three of these talks were wonderful. Really appreciate your engagement. We have just a little bit of time. Uh, I've been looking at the questions coming in. Uh, we just have a few. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Bardwaj. Uh, I'm curious to know if there is a role for genetic profiling of uh, small cell carcinoma in clinical practice. Um, considering the resources that it takes in terms of time and also finances, it might not be uh, pos practically possible to molecular uh, to do molecular profiling on on uh, all small cell carcinomas of the uterine cervix. So it's not as practical. Mm -hmm. But maybe in some um, rare situations, for instance, the cases that the authors excluded, where a metastatic deposit from lung could not be excluded. So if there is a clinical mm. case like that, having a molecular profile uh, of the tumor showing, let's say, P53 retinoblastoma, which was not seen at all in any of the studies, so mutations like those or presence of smoking-related signatures, that could provide some answer, and it might be clinically beneficial knowing the origin. Okay, great. Thank you. A question for Dr. Sutomura. 
did the authors of your paper make any reference to the different ways of doing a cervical cone excision, like a cold knife conization versus a electrosurgical excision or leap? Did they discuss that issue at all? No, they don't detail the specific method used. They just talk about conization. Uh, they don't detail that. Okay. Yeah, I can I can see what the point of the question would be. Uh, a cold knife cone tends to have uh, be a larger specimen and have margins that are easier to interpret. So in a case where one was concerned about the margins, Yes, uh, it would be, be interesting, to, one of the points to yeah. add for future directions. Maybe yeah. interesting to specify if it was a lip or a cold knife. Cold knife cone. Uh, but they don't say nothing they about don't discuss. that. Okay. And for Dr. Aglobelin, we have a question about these glands that we see in the vagina, right? Normally, that's not a glandular area. Where do you think the prostatic type glands are coming from? That's a very interesting question. Uh, that's why the cohort group and control group could be very helpful to see if we do see this actually tissue in the vagina. So first of all, the uh, we do have, there are normal prostatic type glands happening in the vagina, specifically in the anterior vaginal wall and goes ar around the urethral area, which attributed what embryonically developed as a skin glands and certain types of a pathology can derive from the skin glands, which reminds the prostatic type pathology in a uh, male patient. However, in this patient, the likely answer is, is a uh, it's a metaplastic process. So there is a reprogramming mm -hmm. of the epithelium. I'm not sure if it's a endocervical gland epithelium or some um, uh, vaginal glands epithelium, or it's a squamous lining reprogramming because these glands seem to be appear start appearing at the uh, basal layer of the normal epithelial lining and then they expand to the cervix. And there are some work, not this work, but the other work uh, showed that uh, a lot of these glands actually do um, express the androgen receptors and is believed that they start responding to testosterone exposure and therefore that's what's the driving force behind this metaplastic mm -hmm. process. Great, a great answer. Thank you very much. Well, I think that we can go ahead and close out this webinar. I uh, want to thank the presenters again and also all the audience for being here and uh, I hope to see you again uh, on a future ISGIP live webinar. The recording will be uh, posted to the isgip.ca website and we also try to put it out on uh, YouTube in due time so uh, you can catch it again. Thanks everyone and have a good morning, afternoon, or evening. Yeah, great job thank to you. the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.